Excuse. Davis. Excuse. Groff. Here. Hannah. Here. Kittleson. Here. Kittleson. Here. Oh, thank you. Clayunis. Here. Manny. Here. Meyer. Here. Montemayor. Here. Radke. Here. Ryan. Here. Susha. Here. Vanderweel. Here. And Verhassel. Here. Fourteen present. Quorum is present. At this time, we'll pledge allegiance to the beautiful country we live in. And I'd ask Attorney McLean to lead us. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you, Attorney McLean. First item on the agenda is resolutions introduced three, S2-1 will lie over. Second item on the agenda, and that being the only item, is presentation of the architectural design of the new police station. And I'd ask uh, Mr. Sabanesh to uh, please come forward. Uh, before, you, before you get going, I'd like to thank you, sir, for being here today, helping us out. Uh, Looks like we've come a, a longer way now than we have uh, in the past. Thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. I, I'm going under the assumption that because this is a uh, special meeting, I'll keep the presentation short and allow as many questions as you have to be answered as quickly as I can get them answered. So I believe you received a packet of information that included some graphic uh, diagrammatic information that was generated as part of the executive planning meeting. That was the very first meeting that we had. There will be a number of different meetings that begin to make a more solid definition of what the project is going to be. This is the very first effort to try to cite the building and give a graphic representation of what we think the building could look like. In addition to that, information was presented to you that defined some schedule and some budget information which I'll review last. So. Uh, the first piece of the puzzle, I guess, is, is how the building may be organized. And again, don't, don't get too beholden to this. There's an awful lot of engineering, an awful lot of planning that has to go into it. But it indicates that the building fits on site. I think it's a handsome orientation and a good project to build on based on that premise. Uh, as it's currently proposed, the building would have an entrance on the west portion of the site, a lobby portion somewhere in this zone. Most of the public spaces would be oriented to the west of the building. So the building's most public features are oriented, oriented toward 23rd Street. As the building progresses and is designed uh, toward the rear of the site, toward the east, more of the uh, pieces of the police department that are most s exclusive are, are, are located in that zone. So what we start to see is that uh, some of the training and patrol functions start to be relegated to that zone. Uh, the sally port and uh, booking zones of the building are oriented on the north piece with potential of an access drive and additional parking which would be located to the north. The option exists as the design progresses that the building could become actually a little fatter in this orientation and we would start to look at additional parking in the uh, sort of the rear of the site. Use this works a little bit better here. Yeah, that's better. Um, and in addition to that, we are looking at trying to uh, offer as much value relative to enclosed parking as we can. So we'll continue to study the option to enclose as much of the parking, whether it's to the north of the building or to the uh, east, with enclosed uh, building of less cost. We'd be looking at pole buildings or more prefabricated structures for that. And as it relates to how the program might be enhanced relative to that process, we'd also look at putting some uh, the possibility of additional program functions within that space where it's more economical than the body of the building. So in terms of orientation, again, let's go into this fairly quickly. Uh, the major public spaces of the building are located at the front, so the training and, and functional court and toilet facil facilities are there. Opportunity directly off the lobby to have access to information services as well as the possibility of communications back in this zone. As we proceed along this uh, sort of internal circulation spine, Administrative functions are located proximate to information services. Um, investigations are located adjacent to administration. And we start to get the evidentiary processing and evidence uh, storage facilities on the, uh, I guess, the, the uh, southeast corner of the building. And then training lockers and the like are located uh, in conjunction with patrol. We would have the opportunity to have staff entrance that would allow us to get uh, officers back out on the street as quickly as possible. And the thing to imagine relative to this is uh, as budget allows as much of this that's uh, 
associated potentially with uh, squad parking would potentially be enclosed. And so that's what we're beginning, uh, we're beginning to uh, consider and orient relative to the plan. Public parking would be off of 23rd Street and generally zoned uh, proximate to the main entrance of the building and there could be additional parking that would filter across this north edge. So that's fundamentally how the building is organized. It's a single story and uh, we'll be looking to try to uh, optimize the parking layout relative to issues relative to stormwater management and the like. In terms of how the building is conceived uh, in, in, in three-dimensional form, uh, we viewed that the, uh, we have a limited budget, but we have some areas of the building that are, uh, are generally dedicated to the public at large. And so we're focusing most of the, uh, the effort relative to uh, the exuberance of the project to the main entrance and the public areas of the building. Uh, in addition to that, uh, zones that are generally more uh, internalized are going to be illuminated by clear story lighting, light from above, so that we're uh, providing uh, light-filled environments for the people that are working within the building. It's conducive to productivity and makes a, a highly a high quality environment for the people that are going to be working within the facility. Uh, generally, the uh, comp composition of the building is uh, a masonry exterior backed up by masonry on the interior, so it's a high quality building envelope. Uh, we're going to be prudent in the amount of glass that we use because glass is fairly expensive, but we want to use it in places where it's going to give a nice working environment to the people that work in the building. So the areas that we are focusing on very readily are obviously these internalized areas. And then the zones of the building, administration, if you remember, uh, investigative services and information services mm -hmm. along this edge, and you'll see a similar type treatment on the north face. Are there any questions relative to the exterior? It's clearly a modern building. Okay. This isn't a, you know, if we're on, on the city hall site, we might be looking at something that was more, uh, more regimented in terms of its uh, organization. This is clearly a modern building. So it's a building of its time. And I think as it develops, we'll have some opportunity to make a very handsome statement for the city. I have a yes. Do you want to do the mic? Yes, hold on. Uh, Alderman Graff. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, with, with this exterior shot and so forth, now there's been several things that have been moved out of the, um, the Sheridan Park site. And one of the things that used to be in the building and now I believe is going to be, is proposed to be outside is the mechanicals. Is that correct? Um, uh, yes, one of the techniques that we would use is um, dedicating the space that we have to police functions as opposed to mechanical system. But there's also a piece of it that uh, tends to be a, a, a good thing, and that's that the, uh, we're still going to have a boiler system, so an internal boiler, um, but we'll probably take the air handler and place it on the roof. The quality of the air handlers in that environment have improved, so we, have, we feel more comfortable with them as a product. Um, and then we will use the mass of the building to do the screening. So we would prefer not to put money into mechanical screening devices, which are probably going to be required. And so what we're doing is we would envision using the building and the pieces of the building that are already doing something, in this case, illuminating the interior to be the screening mechanisms for those units. So it's an economical and a reliable concept for how we would deliver that system, and it's, it's a, a superior product to what it was even 10 years ago. And we're still using... Uh, the most appropriate means to heat the building. So we're using a, a hot water heated system rather than electric or gas, which are generally more uh, expensive in the long run. Can you show us on this design where it might go? Uh, I would tend to say it would probably be back in this zone. Uh, it, it, you're looking at this in perspective, so this is a high sort of clear story volume in a, a central circulation spine. And then in addition to that, we're proposing to have a relatively high volume that separates the base of the building, the most public spaces of the building in this zone, from the balance of the police department. So it's something we'd probably be looking at on the north side of the building, okay. and uh, we'd be using the building mass to screen that accordingly. Okay, thank you. If any alderman wishes to speak, just click your button. Alderman Clay Eunice. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one of the things that's been brought up uh, by uh, some citizen, and I, it's a concern of mine, is that we're using environmentally good technology, you know, energy saving um, design, energy saving materials uh, so that we have something that's economical to run and mm -hmm. efficient and uh, long standing. I mean, that's your company subscribes to that as well. Uh, as Correct. Well as we possible. have we have two lead certified buildings. It happen to not be police department buildings, but we're uh, the, the designer of this project is uh, a lead certified professional. Right. and. 
highly knowledgeable about the techniques that we can apply and where they're prudent and where it makes uh, long-term sense. Great, thank you. Alderman Kittleson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just going back to the mechanical part of the bill, then what you're saying to us is those mechanicals will be hidden quite nicely, so that, you know, that shouldn't be an, an issue at all uh, from an architectural standpoint. Y yes, uh, we, do, we is, architects is, don't like to see them. Mechanical engineers really do like to see them. We don't. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but we're, we would be proponents of the philosophy that uh, and it came up relative to another topic. We did a communication center in Waukesha, and the, the issue relative to that was how to keep vehicles from hitting the building. And so the design of the site took into account that we had drainage soils, and we used the drainage soils to actually be barriers. So where we're using building elements, we want to try to get more than one use out of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the, the consideration of something like a drainage swale, if we use that as an element to make the building more secure because vehicles can't hit the building, we get more bang from the buck by putting it in a place where it does two things rather than one. Mm -hmm. And so in considering that, if we're looking at mechanicals, it certainly wouldn't be a good design if we put a mechanical unit up here and then had to screen it. So we want to use the building that already has mass to use the mass of the building that we already doing it for a purpose to get an end product that reduces something else that would be a ripple down. So we want to be cognizant of those efforts. Good. Thank you. One, one more. Alderman Boren. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Sabanash, if you could go back to that area of the Sally Port. I just got a couple questions about how that's going to work. Uh, you envision them driving in to the Sally Port, and then is there going to be a way that then when they're when they want to proceed over to the detention detention center that they can just circle out of there, or how do you, how is that potentially going to work, or is it too early to tell you? Well, we already had some feedback from the police on that issue, and it's likely that it's going to be reconfigured into a drive-through. Okay. So Good. the way it was envisioned initially was it was more of a perpendicular environment. We'll we'll, we'll abandon that and we'll go to a drive-through concept. In that idea. It's likely that this driveway would widen out and we'd be able to proceed through on either direction. This might actually become a little bit bigger and you might see more paving in this zone, but the idea is drive through the space rather than drive in back out. So, so we'll it, make that adjustment accordingly. It would be completely enclosed though, so they're not exposed to the elements when they take the, the uh, suspects out of the cars. They're going to be inside? Yes. Okay, good. It's in the building. Okay, and then uh, they're, holding, they're holding our interview rooms. Mm -hmm for the suspects will be in close proximity then? Correct. It's this zone. It's hard to read. It's booking. Um, okay, good. Part of the idea is that we want to get watch command pro uh, proximate to dispatch as well as the booking area because that person maintains surveillance of both areas. So we're looking at that as being sort of the linchpin of the design. But other issues relative to booking is exterior access. So when we release someone, we're not taking them through the building. Um, and then proximity to patrol, which has the lion's share of the effort relative to booking uh, initially and gets them back in the patrol zone where they can do their paperwork and the like without having to go through the building. And if I could just ask one more then, uh, the enclosed garage is envisioned to be on the west side or would that be over on the north side? We're not sure yet. In this idea, it would be the north, but we've okay. already talked at, at some length about the likelihood that the building might start to move a little bit to the south. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that the north zone of the the the, uh, the site being uh, available for parking makes some sense. It's all also makes some sense potentially for future expansion in you know the next 50 years, and it's likely that we would start to maybe see some of that enclosed space migrate to the east. When this starts to become a little fatter, it's likely that some of these components on the eastern portion would migrate into the building, and the building would get fatter, and then that would be the zone that the garage would be in. But we're not sure if that's necessarily uh, the best approach quite yet. Thank you. Thank you. One more. Alderman Hanna. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about your philosophy on the open space corridor that goes through and how you envision the, the, the various departments being able to utilize that space? Um, the, the wider area that's designated in white off the lobby is, and, and it, it matches in the three-dimensional diagram, this raised central zone along this edge. Um, that area is generally a collaborative space. It, it uh, allows mixing of, if we were to view these as suites, 
that patrol was in an area and uh, investigations was in an area. It allows those groups to meet in an area that's more significant than just a five foot wide corridor. So it allows um, happen, just meeting by happenstance and exchange of information by happenstance. And it's, it's not an atypical idea that we see, not necessarily in municipal buildings, but within sort of corporate culture that uh, the overall experience of working is enriched by commingling of ideas. Uh, it's something that we're, we're doing actually in an academic building in Madison that uh, uh, takes the approach that uh, um, philosophically it's like one big coffee pot, but it happens all day without that distraction. If we can get that cross-pollination, that mixing of uh, environment for people that don't necessarily have to do it otherwise, it's more likely that information is going to be exchanged that makes the uh, the job that they do more efficient, more profound, and better, to be better informed to people working in a building like that. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, please continue. I'd, I'd like to talk about the schedule. <clears throat> and I'll look at it in... Um, terms of where we think we are today and then from an optimistic viewpoint that I, I think will be uh, generated as part of the December exercise is that we would initially envision having schematic design extending through February. Uh, design development is the point where the engineers become more profoundly involved in the project. They start to uh, uh, attend meetings and define systems and thicknesses of walls based on what's necessary to engineer the facility. would happen in a two-month process in March and April. And then we would start to wean them in um, into construction document mode in April and really extend through July, bid the project in August, and we would forecast a 12-month process of building the project. Um, that would uh, complete the project in September of 2008. There's an alternative that based on how well the, the schematic design goes, and this is still very early in the process when things are very fluid, um, schematic design is it's a it's a design process sometimes you have really good events that make the day very good sometimes you take a step back sometimes you have to reiterate things and view them from a different perspective if the design really comes together fully then we think we can cut a month out of the schematic design schedule which would complete it essentially in January and if that happens we'd be looking to complete the construction documents in in June hopefully the beginning of June of 2007. And where we see that that might be advantageous is if, we're, if we have got the contractor on board in July of 2007, we can probably look at a compressed construction schedule. We would have fully five months before the weather goes bad, so we'd probably be enclosed. We'd look at potentially cutting the 12-month schedule down to 10 months, and there are advantages in that regard. So the, the effort, I think, is going to be can we get a plan in place that seems to make some sense um, operationally, budgetarily, and fulfill the design goals that we've identified, do so in a way that allows us to have adequate documents, thorough documents, and do so uh, in the opportunity that relates to that is can we get that out in June so that we've got more time for the contractor to build the site when the weather is good, and compress the construction schedule as a result. Are there any questions relative to the schedule? Yes, there's a question here. Alderman Susha. Um, thank you, Your Honor. And first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Sabinash for bringing in a proposal tonight with the, the first uh, go around. The total project cost comes in at $8.8 .8 million. And I really appreciate you uh, keeping in mind the $9 million cap. So thank you very much for bringing in this proposal. Um, there is a, a committee that's meeting, a joint uh, shared service committee between the city and the county, and uh, they have been spending the last couple of months looking at the possibility of going with a joint dispatch. Uh, they overcame the first hurdle and decided to move forward with looking at uh, how they would structure it and how they would organize it if we go jointly. Um, and there's a new committee that's being formed. I believe they're given 60 or 90 days to look at this. And given the schedule, at what point in this schedule would you need to know if we're going to have telecommunication services in the new police station or not, when would you need to know that? If the effort was to remove the program space from the building as soon as possible, because where it sits currently in the plan is is 
Uh, it's right up there, and it's in, it's integrated into the building, so it's right here. It's not the same as, let's say, if we had, uh, let's, say, let's say we were talking about this from an evidence perspective, and we could just basically lop this corner off. That could go out a ways. But in this case, if you said get rid of the space sooner rather than later, if you looked at it and you said, I'll reserve the space. I'm going to build the building. It's just going to be shell. I'm not going to fit it out for communications. I'm going to fit it out for something else. Then you could actually carry that out quite a ways, and we could actually design the building, maybe even do an alternate bid on what it might be as a communication center or what it might be as something else. And that could actually go out through, let's say, basically the spring, first quarter of 08, uh, 07. So if you, were, if you were looking at it from the perspective of you wanted to get rid of the space, because of where it is, it's very hard to do. If you said, I'll carry that as just space in the building, it would be something else in the future to evolve into something else, that could actually go out into the spring of uh, 07. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderman Bourne. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Going down to the bottom of, the, uh, of this sheet here, mm -hmm. where it says uh, 32,000 to 35,000 square feet with a 10 to 20,000 foot uh, pole building, uh, I guess the projected growth for Sheboygan over the next 20 years is only four or 5,000 people. I think, I think I have that figure right. Uh, in your opinion, if we get close to the 35,000 square feet, uh, in your opinion, is that square footage with that kind of growth perceived four or 5,000 dollars over, or four or 5,000 people over the next 20 years, is from your experience, would that make this police station portion of the building sufficient? Well, when we had the original program, that gets very close to hitting the building components, irrespective of vehicle maintenance, garage, and other big spaces, which were part of the discussion about the magnitude of the project. It's really close to hitting the building pieces, which were the rooms, the spaces, the offices. The pieces that the PD and we had worked initially on, on sizing, it's really close to hitting those. So I would say yes, with the exception of the discussion about fleet or mm -hmm. other peripheral items or major programs, it's really close to hitting the building piece that we were targeting. Uh, how many square feet are we uh, projecting for the, uh, for the communications? Uh, I, I don't remember what that was. Uh, In terms of net square feet, it is 1,325. Okay. So that would be that would be the 9, the 911 dispatch area. Yes. If we built it in there. Okay. Uh, okay, that's all for now. Thank you. It, it has sort of segued into the budget, so I think you've all got a budget sheet in front of you. Um, what we've tried to do is, as we have in the past, is provide a comprehensive budget that's transparent, you know, where the money is. And um, the effort is going to be to maximize the value of the project. And to maximize the value of the project is going to be uh, building in things that will cost less in the long run, value engineering or cost-benefit analysis, building as much space as we can and identifying and pocketing the space into places where it's less costly and prudent to put it because it is less costly or it can evolve. I'd prefer to think about the project, not necessarily in terms of future growth, but adaptability. So when we start looking at storage rooms and things like that, where traditionally in the past you might say a storage room needs one outlet or something, we would tend to look at it and forecast that maybe we need to pre-invest in that storage room, build it as though it were an office, and then in the future you'd be able to move into that expediently and, and effectively. So. As we view the budget, we, we, you know, like any time else in the project, you're always cautious about where you are. I think the number is a good number. I think we will have opportunities to add value, be it in shell space or magnitude of pole building or garage space relative to the building. And uh, we'll be doing everything that we can to increase the usable building area as part of the progression of the design or the evolution of the design. Born. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, when I when I toured the uh, Oak Creek Police Station, which was also one of your one of one of the that you helped build, uh, Chief Bauer said that, and I'm just looking at a line item here for office furniture, that he was able to get a government price on that furniture. I don't know how he did it, but he said on the scale of ten, he was able to get a like a seven quality furniture, and it was beautiful. 
it really was. Is that something that you automatically do when you're, you know, with the office furniture to try to get that government price to get, you know, an up, an upscale in the quality for a lot less money? Well, the uh, I'll just review, sort of, uh, uh, broadly how furniture is procured, in the in the systems furniture market. The, if you were doing an office building and you had movable partitions, that's the kind of furniture that we're, we're referring to. Um, there are a number of different suppliers. There are two different mechanisms for procuring that furniture relative to municipalities. One is to bid the product out, and the difficulty with bidding the product out is um, they're not all the same. They just aren't. They're not engineered the same. If everybody engineered them the same, there wouldn't be seven different companies providing furniture. They all think they have a better way of doing something. Price points are different. Quality levels are different. So bidding the product out is very difficult. There's another mechanism in place, which is um, buying off the state contract. You may have heard it that way. It's not necessarily exactly that way. But what the furniture vendors do is they basically bid the furniture products out in a competitive environment and lock that price in to all government agencies. And so what happened on Oak Creek, which is and it, and it's still a bid product, is if you go and buy off of that magnitude contract, there are certain price points and levels for all the furniture that are guaranteed by the, by the vendors. Um, and you can basically go in knowing what the furniture costs, which is very difficult in a bid climate because you really don't know. And it's hard to furnish something without knowing what it's going to cost. Um, so the effort there, and it's been effort that has been used in other municipalities is you, you essentially go in and you have this bid list of product and you fit your budget into that product and you can control price points on things that are important. So where a task chair um, that maybe lists at $1,200, which sounds exorbitant, but that's what they list for, um, maybe has an actual bid price of something less than that, maybe $400. It might be on the state contract for $300. You can go in there and you can start to see where it's appropriate to spend a lot of money on a task chair because somebody's going to be using it for an extended period of time and where you might spend less money on a certain kind of chair in a different area that doesn't take the abuse and need the adaptability. Um, in communications, traditionally those are very expensive chairs because people sit on them very long. In a training room, you're not going to see a $300 chair. You can see a stacking feature or something else. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to tailor your budget to exactly what you want and pick your price points so that you have a comprehensive idea of everything that you're taking. And it's likely that we would there's some line items in here for rehabilitation. There are usually some card files and some other unique pieces of equipment that the police department has that are sort of irreplaceable. Sort of like the uh, uh, card file that you saw at the library. We, they're hard to get now. So there's money in there to be able to electrostatically paint that and rehabilitate and restore that furniture. So um, there's still money in the budget as well to uh, look at some of the pieces that we'd like to take over and have a consistent appearance with. Thank you. <clears throat> That's all I had for today. Anything else? I want to thank the aldermen for their patience, too. We've, we've come a long ways. Thank you very much. We're moving forward. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye, aye, aye. We stand adjourned. Aye, aye. 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 John, that's the easiest meeting in Oregon.